On today's episode of the show, I'm really excited to be joined by Rob Williams. Coach Williams uh, is working out of BC, North Vancouver area, and has a really great Instagram page that I stumbled on uh, kind of earlier this year, talking about everything from you know quarterback play, movement, uh, movement fundamentals, and and as a kin background guy myself, someone who's played football you know my whole life and grew up in a coaching family, um, you know I was really interested by his page because I've you know been living in that world and that's what I chose to pursue in my education and. You know, I feel like I've learned a ton just from watching videos that get posted daily on, on Rob's page. So I was super glad to get the chance to get you on, Coach. And if you want to give kind of a little intro of, of what you're doing right now and kind of how you got to be working in that field, and then we'll get into some specific stuff after that. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, your kin background and football background, you know, when you when you blend those together, you know, it probably didn't take long to realize that a lot of what you learned in football didn't didn't jive with what you were learning in Kim. Um, you know, and that and that was sort of me. I was I played all sports growing up, had lots of injuries, knew that I wanted to go into kinesiology, uh, grew up in a town where there was no football and always wanted to play. So when I went to university, uh, at, you know, I injured my knee before I started university, had a surgery. So that put me back a couple of years. But I eventually walked onto the football team uh, at Simon Fraser and never having played a down of football. I, I remember getting my pads. I didn't even know how to put the pads together to put them on. And um, so learning football with a, with a fresh set of eyes and coming from my background with other sports and, and injuries. And then as I started to learn kinesiology, I, you know, I started to realize that a lot of the injuries were related to how the athletes were moving and the way we were being coached to move from a football perspective didn't necessarily align with the best ways to move when we start talking about anatomy and biomechanics and physics and, and basically the science of kinesiology. So uh, ultimately, I ended up having to stop playing football because of a pelvic injury uh, that came from pelvic instability and nobody knew anything about it really at the time. And so as I, you know, I sort of promised myself that I was going to minimize the number of athletes that, you know, had a dream and had to stop because of injuries. And then I started to see how much the, the principles of kinesiology to help them avoid being injured also improved their performance. And so, you know, I've really tailored my, my professional practice uh, to football. I still work with, you know, all athletes, all sports, uh, non-athletes, but specifically football. And then uh, in football, I've gravitated a lot towards quarterbacks. I've got two sons that are teenagers that both play quarterback. Uh, I'm, when I, my older son started playing quarterback, you know, I started seeking out uh, information for him you know, coaching clinics and things like that, where, where he could get good information. Um, and again, I further realized that so much of what was being coached to quarterbacks, uh, didn't just, the physics didn't work. Uh, what they were being told to do was counterproductive. Uh, and you know, and I say this all the time, it's nobody's fault. It was just, you know, Golf's sort of ahead of the curve. Um, even baseball pitching is, you know, a little further ahead than the world of quarterback mechanics. Quarterback mechanics hadn't had the evolution yet where we said, well, let's bring the science into it and let's, and let's talk about, you know, how they're being taught to throw a ball. And through all of that and all the different athletes, um, my practice goes towards, I work with a lot of offensive linemen. You know, if you can teach an old lineman how to actually anchor into the ground, so he might be 340 pounds and, you know, pro bowl NFL lineman, but if he can't anchor, there's money left on the table and it's not, you know, Hey, we don't need to get him in the gym and make him stronger. Um, it's, it's more about how to use your body to get the most out of what you already have. And there's always so much, so much room for improvement, um, change of direction. So running backs, receivers, DBs, that's an area that, you know, I know you're interested in and that I've really seen, again, there's money left on the table. Just Let's just use a couple of laws of physics and say, okay, when we have an athlete that's running that direction, we want him to turn and go that direction. There are some things that are, that are just non-negotiables. Um, we know it in other aspects and other sports, but it's not what's been coached in football yet. So, you know, to me, it's, I, I lie awake at night going like, wow, how did, you know, how did this not, get applied before. 
And when you see the eyes of NFL, CFL, you know, D1 university high school athletes and, and they feel it and they just stop and they just like, that's crazy. That was effortless. That was, you know, change of direction. That was, I was so much quicker getting in and out of that cut. So that's for me where I've tailored, you know, my practice and what I get excited about and I can talk forever about obviously. So, um, you know, do you want to start with sort of change of direction? Is that your thoughts? Yeah, and I, and I think what's yeah. cool about this, and obviously, you know, I, the, the Instagram account, that the first Instagram account that I followed you on was your QB motion page. So that was, you know, a lot that yeah. that was kind of what drew me into what you were doing, and I was loving it. And then, you know, I think I saw a video, I think you were working with Johnny Augustine, who's actually, I'm from Guelph, so I watched him okay. play and coached against yeah. him a little bit. Um, we were, I was, I think I was playing uh, and then coaching kind of what he was, in his career at UG. So, you know, I saw that and I was like, man, I didn't even know, like I was impressed and, and enjoying learning some of the stuff you just have a quarterback play. But I think, like you said, there's so much, you know, when you talk about leaving money on the table, whether that's just injuries and, you know, or it, and it's not so much, okay, I didn't achieve my best. I just wasn't at my best as much as I should because I'm hurt. Um, I think like players think about that, but I don't think players think about whether it's movement skills or, you know, I talk to our young guys all the time, flexibility, mobility, Right. How that affects yeah. your, your pure performance, right? Yeah. And how, you know, a couple little things can can help. Not just, yeah, you're going to be healthy and that's good. And, like, I feel like when players hear that from coaches, they nod their head and go, yeah, everyone wants to be healthy. I get it. But yeah. they don't realize how much can help the performance. So, you know, when talking about change of direction and feel free to go any, any way you want with it in terms of, you know, running back, DB, receiver, or just in generalities, you know, what are kind of the keys for you when you're – when you're looking at an athlete, like what do you what do you not want to see? I guess like what are you yeah. going to look at and try and fix? And then what's your kind of process for for doing that? I think, um, and, and you know, our whole conversation, you're gonna you'll hear me sort of reference this a lot, and it's it's what I refer to as like an if I want to change your lens of how you view athletic movement. And so when you look at a receiver or a running back or a quarterback and okay, let me take a look at that movement. See, do I think it was efficient or not? That lens is, is basically a philosophy of did the movement start in the middle of their body or did it start at the ends of their body? And almost all positions in most sports have been historically coached from the ends of the body. So if we, let's go back to quarterbacks there's an entire multi-million dollar industry for quarterbacks that's basically been built around from the elbow to the hand and you know quarterback gurus everywhere who you know if you don't have the your knuckle on the seam of the ball or your finger in the right place on the laces there's no way you can throw a good ball and and massive amounts of emphasis placed on this segment of the body and and everybody knowing if your thumbs are not in the right spot you know that's not going to be a spiral it's not going to be accurate etc and when I came in and said, well, okay, like this is less than 5% of that quarterback's body. Now imagine, so if we've optimized this, but if the rest of it isn't optimized, what are the chances this is going to do the right things? So if my base isn't right and I'm not generating my power with the right muscles and everything else. So, you know, and the other thing was front toes, you know, point your toes at the target and then you're going to be accurate. Well, where your toes are doesn't have anything to do really with where the football goes. Um, we want to make sure that instead of using the smaller muscles at the ends of the body to do the majority of the work, go back to kinesiology, we want to use the bigger muscles in the center of the body that are attached to the biggest bones and the biggest joints to do the heavy lifting. We want them to drive the power. We want them to create the movement. And then we want to fine tune with the elbow to hand or the foot. So if you think about most change of direction, um, whether it be, you know, receivers running a route or, or uh, you know, running back running with a ball, there's so much talk about, you know, with receivers, right? Break down, beat the drum. Um, there's, you know, point your foot here. There's so much talk about the distal extremities, what they're doing with the feet, what they're doing with their arms. But the problem is, is that whether or not that's a quick, efficient change of direction is going to be determined by the big muscles, the muscles in the body that are designed to change direction. They, you know, they'll decelerate, they'll abduct, they'll externally rotate, they'll propel. 
you know, and this is where we start talking more about the glute muscles and the hip flexors and the abductors of the hips. And so if we're being coached from the periphery to do things with our hands and feet, but we're expected to do a movement that requires these other bigger, more proximal muscles to create the movement, we get a situation where that running back or receiver gets to the point of their cut, breaks down as they've been coached, but gets stuck, doesn't get in and out, doesn't what I call ricochet with full velocity. They basically stop and now have to restart in their new direction. Um, we want to try to minimize that. We want to, we want to try to minimize, unless there's a reason for it, unless it's like, okay, I'm going to decel, throw a head fake, get the guy stuck, and now I'm going to get out. But if it's, hey, I, I need to get in and out of this change of direction as quickly as possible, which I find most change of direction, it would, it would be beneficial if I'm in and out of it fast. Well, how do I coach that athlete to be in a position where the best muscles that are designed to do that action are contributing? Okay, well, now I need to talk about changing their body position, changing their angles, changing their movement strategy. And then also way deeper than that, I need to talk about activating their intrinsic stabilization system so that when they hit that moment of change of direction and all their inertia wants them to go straight ahead, they need to come out at 90 degrees. If they're not connected inside their body, what's going to happen is they're going to spill, they're going to shear, certain muscles won't fire that should be firing. And so now it's an inefficient change of direction. Um, and that's... I mean, the, the depth of science and knowledge and research that's gone into how to stabilize the, the pelvis and the spine, you know, it's massive. There's a whole world of rehab. There's a whole, you know, whole world of surgical medicine that's all around, you know, how do we stabilize your pelvis? How do we stabilize your spine? Um, if we teach an athlete how to do that inside their body, whether they're hitting somebody, throwing a football, changing direction, blocking, um, if they're tied together, every movement is going to be more efficient. But that's part of what's been been missing in the sport. And, you know, I, I talk about it, especially when I do like quarterback camps, I do a lot of stuff with the Elite 11. You know, we'll have 100 quarterbacks there and I'll say, okay, I have 100 quarterbacks. Now, pregame, you guys get all strapped up, you're geared up, you got your lids on, you got, you know, who would start the game without tying their cleats? You know, and everybody's looking at it like nobody puts up their hand. None of them would ever think about starting a football game without lacing up their cleats. And I said, well, well, why? What would happen? You know, well, you might slip, you'd trip, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be connected to the ground, like lots of great answers. And that's exactly inside your body. If we haven't activated this intrinsic stabilization system, every move you make, basically your body is going to shift and shear. It won't be stable. It won't be connected. The muscles that attach to that unstable structure won't create maximal force because they know that they're connected to something that's unstable. So without that inner unit core activation and the right muscles doing the job, now the body won't perform at its best. And we know then we start getting shearing, we start getting slippage of joints and we expose that athlete to injury. So let's get, you know, make sure they're stable intrinsically, make sure their core is working to stabilize their pelvis and their spine, make sure they move from the center of the body when they want to create their movement, use the biggest muscles that are designed to do these massive, powerful movements. And then now let's use the extremities for control, for precision, for spinning the football, for, you know, like, so that's the, that's the lens. Like if we can use a lens of, okay, I'm not going to look at where his foot was pointing. I'm going to look at what his hips did. You know, I'm going to look at whether or not he separated his pelvis from his rib cage in the middle of the movement. Um, because, you know, especially in rotary movements, that's almost everything. But it's something that, that hasn't really been identified. So long explanation, but if, if I've got an athlete that's running this direction and I want them to come out that direction, I want to look at what's their strategy because there has to be some deceleration before a change of direction because if they don't decelerate before they hit that moment, that change of direction or cutting step, as I call it, they're not going to be able to carry their speed through the cut. So how do they decelerate? What's their strategy for that? 
Uh, what's their leverage? What's their body angle at that moment of change of direction? Um, you know, are they leaning into the cut or are they spilling outside the cut? Are they top heavy? You know, because they should always be leaning in. Um, again, unless it's intentionally, I'm going to throw a head shoulder fake where we might have a subtle movement. But if even if that compromises the efficiency of the change of direction, then you'd be better off just doing a really good cut and not worrying about the head shoulder fake. If your head shoulder fake gets you stuck and now it takes you forever to accelerate out of that, doesn't do all the, you know, the fakes you want that DB or linebacker is just going to, yeah, okay. You know, you're not going anywhere. Oh, now you're going to start running again. I got you. Right. So, um, that deceleration strategy, that leverage. And then now when we come out, do we propel with the big powerful muscles or do we basically reach pull, which is a distal movement strategy as we start to come out of that change of direction? So, you know, lots of words, but when I'm out on a field and I'm trying to get, you know, skill athletes and quarterbacks, and I mean, I use exact same stuff with linemen because it's all about leverage. But, you know, the example I give is, okay, you guys, you guys all know if you're rolling down a hill on a bike and you're moving pretty fast and it's time to turn to the left and you start to turn to the left, but in the middle of that turn, you lean your shoulders and head out to the right, where are you going? And they're like, well, you're going down the hill, like you're going to, you're going to fly off your bike. Exactly. You know that your bike, as you, as you roll down the hill, the bike needs to lean in and your body better be leaning in with your bike. Because if you don't, you lose that inside leverage. And so, you know, with a guy like Johnny Augustine, um, unbelievable athlete, super explosive, crazy hard worker. At the moment he's changing direction, if I came and just pushed on him with two fingers, I'd spill him outside his cut when he started because there wasn't that, that leverage. Now, when he gets that leverage, he's in and out of his cuts. Uh, you know, I use the example of like throw a tennis ball at a 45 degree angle to a wall. It skips off the wall and comes out at full speed. That's, that's how we want to cut in and out done. Right. Not, you know, beat the drum, pound the feet, come to almost a stop. And then, you know, now start coming out of that. And again, it's situational, but when I talk to coaches and I say, okay, well, let me just, let me understand because I don't know football the way you do uh, as a football coach. I didn't grow up playing football. I never played quarterback. I never played running back or receiver. I was a D lineman. I played D tackle. Um, but so you tell me what you want that athlete to do. Do you want him to get out of that cut quickly and get separation from that defensive player? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, here's the right strategy for getting that to happen and to be efficient. Um, so. I mean, to simplify a, a cutting process, unless there's a situational reason to do something different, I, I call it a three-step cut. First step is your break or decel step, and there's a, there's a strategy for where it goes, what angle that foot is at, what's happening with the rest of the body when you, when you drop that decel step. Your second step is your cutting or your change of direction foot. Um, simple way to look at that is if I'm doing a 90 degree cut, that second step should be at 45 degrees. If I'm doing a 60 degree cut, it should be at 30. So that foot splits the angle of my cut. Now where the foot goes is determined by what the hips are doing. So the foot is only a barometer of what happened at the hip. So, you know, here's the outcome. That's where your foot was. But the reason that happened is because your hips did or did not do this. But one is decel step, two is change of direction or cutting step, three is, is your drive. You're exploding off the hip of that change of direction foot. You're using the biggest, most powerful muscles, which are the glutes. Because in any cut, we need the pelvis to change direction. It's coming in square and it's turning and it's coming out at whatever angle we're coming out. The muscles that drive, propel, and turn the pelvis are, are the glute muscles. So at the moment, as we decel and hit that change of direction step, if we've gotten into a position where we've inhibited the participation of the glutes by spilling into the, the knees and the toes and loading the quads, now the body's going to try to find a way to get the quads to do what the hips should be doing. 
And that's one of the biggest things, not only in quarterbacks throwing, but in, in anybody changing direction. So if I get into a situation where I'm quad biased, toe loaded, my hips and glutes are inhibited because of my choice of body position and whether I did or didn't, you know, decel properly. Now my quad is, is, will try to do what my glute should do. And when that happens, the quad extends the knee. That's basically the primary function of the quad. Extending the knee wants to send me upward. So when you see somebody cutting and they come in and they compress and they spill into that cutting knee and toe and the weight comes out of their heel and out of their hips, usually their next step is almost vertical. They go down in and they come up. And there's, there's no reason to change levels when what I'm trying to do is come at you and come out over here. So when you see an athlete change levels too much, it's usually, okay, let's rewind it back to how did they decelerate? What's their leverage? Did they get into their hip for their cut or did they spill into their quad? Then if they're in their quad, they're in trouble. They, they, I mean, basically, they've thrown away the best muscles. Now we have to try to make do with less efficient muscles to get out of my cut. And then that's when you'll see things like, you know, the athlete will pop upward or their first step will be under themselves because they can't explode out because they're in a position to use the wrong muscles. So on any, on any sudden change of direction, one, two, three, and they're already gone. And they should be able to do that at very high speeds. So, you know, I've got guys that I've mentored for years and athletes that I've worked with that they'll send me stuff off the internet and it'll be guys, you know, doing cuts and, you know, whether they're self-promoting or coaches promoting, but it'll take them seven steps to get in and out of their cut. And they're moving fast and their feet are moving fast. But if you're taking seven steps in there, you know, a couple in and a couple out, when it could be done in three, we know that's not, you know, you're a freak athlete and you're an excellent football player, but there's so much room to improve that. That's that money so, left on the table, right? And I think that's that's one thing that, and I and I see it, and it's something that I haven't, you know, I haven't learned enough about where I'm at in my career. I got to keep focusing on that. And one of the reasons I was excited to have you on because I do think, like, you see these guys, and like sometimes they'll be able to, like, improvisationally do something. Like, man, what an incredible athlete! Like, they are capable. Yeah. And sometimes, like, those moments are when they like everything ends up aligned. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. I think some of that, like, I mean, there is, you know. I'm a firm believer in natural athleticism because I don't have a ton of it, but you can get a lot, yeah. you know, you, <laughs> I, I've seen guys that are super gifted that continue to improve because they take that ability. Hey, maybe sometimes yeah. naturally their body is able to be tied together. Like you said, or naturally yeah. they're, they're tied together more than, you know, the average athlete, but you know, they're able to take that, you know, a guy, like you said, like Augustine or some of the other, you know, yeah. guys that you work with, and able to, you know, really, really improve that aspect of their game. So you know, that, that's when John, when Johnny first reached out to me and, and, you know, I was looking at mentoring him and, and uh, I just jumped on and I said, okay, well, let me see what's out there on him. And I, and I saw one or two plays of his that's just, okay, wow, this, this, like this guy is an athlete. And even though the movement strategies aren't optimal yet, there's, there's some special stuff in there that we're going to be able to work with. Um, yeah. And then I've all I've all I've seen since then is his work ethic is is crazy. So um, so it's pretty neat. Like it's just one of those situations again where I get jazzed about what the potential is, you know. And I mean For I've been sure. on the field with NFL quarterbacks who like okay you're you've been MVP, but you don't move very well yet. Like yeah. imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, just imagine. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it's that's it's an unbelievable. It's a, that's the fun part of coaching, right? Is being able to see that potential and. And especially when you have guys that are, are willing to listen and put in the work and try and, you know, yeah. change some things that they've even done because they recognize, you know, like you said, whether it's actual money in the pros or it's, you know, just your potential, right? More of a yeah. figurative sense. You don't want to leave that money on the table. Um, so second second part, and, you know, I know we're, we've got about 10 minutes here, but in terms of the quarterback stuff and, and, and there's obviously there's, that's such a big world, right? And it's yeah. something that you've spent a ton of time with. Maybe even if you were just going to, you know, if you're talking to a high school coach and, you know, maybe they didn't play quarterback, like you said, you didn't play quarterback, I didn't play quarterback, um, you know, and they're working with a high school player. What are one or two things that, you know, they should either focus on or really common mistakes that you think they might be able to correct 
Like where yeah. should they start? If you're trying to take, you know, a player that's, you know, a good athlete, high school kids played some football, but isn't a schooled mover, thrower of yeah. the football, where should they start? What's kind of like that, that starting place for them? Um, I do a, I do a couple of really quick screens that are, that are basically, can this athlete start on two feet? And I call it a center fire drill and start on two feet and center fire and land on one foot. Um, so I'm on two, I'm in an athletic position. I call center fire, right. And, and boom, they fire and they try to land on their right foot without falling over and then center fire left. And, and it's unpredictable, but for me, that's a ridiculously simple screen that reveals, um, mostly to the athlete that, you know, I might get them to try 10 times and they might fail eight. You know, I've, I've had NFL running backs fail a hundred percent, couldn't, couldn't land on one foot successfully in like 20 tries. Um, and it's not, again, as I say this all the time, it's not anybody's fault. It's just, oh my man, you're playing at that level and yet you can't land on one foot without losing your balance. And so a really simple thing, if you have, if you've got a quarterback that you're trying to develop, they've got, you know, what they call arm talent. I think it was, you know, like one of the guys to first use that term a lot was Trent Dilfer. Um, yeah. You got a guy who's got potential, but okay, let's, let's see, you know, how balanced, how controlled, how stable you are, because there really isn't a position that relies on control, stability, balance, uh, you know, more so than quarterback. Um, so get them to center fire and see if they can land on their right foot without falling over. And, you know, that means like they're steady and they're balanced and boom, they land on one foot and they stay steady and balanced. It doesn't count if they're, you know, doing this. Um, that's a great place to start just to see if they're functioning. And if you take a kid who, who really is not good at that, like fails on any more than 50% of those attempts, if all you did was teach him a better strategy for, and now it comes down to hip function, but hip function for stability on one foot. And if, and if you could snap your fingers and make them 50% better at landing on one foot with control by using a good strategy, everything else in their quarterback play is going to improve dramatically. And, you know, whether it's pocket movement, drop footwork, you know, during a throw, throwing on the run, they spend most of the game on one foot or the other. If they're off balance when they're on one foot, okay, they're spending most of the game being compromised. And so that's one of the first things. And it's, and it's so foundational. This is, this is almost like saying, okay, before we give you that, you know, great power program in the gym, you know, we're going to see if you can do a body weight squat properly, right? That's how foundational this is. And it's perfect because we need to look at those things that have been kind of whitewashed and ignored. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of a functional movement skill. Now, when I talk about movement strategy, if, like I get quarterbacks from all over the world. They'll send me a video and say, you know, coach, what do you think? Can you give me some input? And I'm just awesome. I love it. Um, guys in Europe and Egypt and the UK. And, and one of the first things that I do visually when I see a quarterback, you know, even a two second video of a quarterback throwing is, and I kind of, I kind of classified this a few years back and, and said, okay, when we come at it from an anatomy and, and kinesiology biomechanics strategy, does that quarterback, is he linear first and then rotary or is he rotary and then linear? And, you know, again, with a lens of understanding a little bit of what that means, most quarterbacks have been coached for decades. And if they emulate some of the guys that they admire, so much of quarterback play was linear, meaning reach the front foot, slide toward the target, spread the arms, push the ball back, push the, you know, the front arm forward, get long, and then, okay, now try to throw. And so when you watch a quarterback, if most of their initial movement is stretch, slide toward the target, that's all linear movement. Now by the time they get there, they're already in a massively compromised situation for creating rotary power velocity. So it's hard to go linear than rotary and guys have made it work, but it's not very efficient. So they'll usually step on their midline. Their back hip will usually have to swing around their front hip. They'll usually end up coming off balance during the throw. Their back leg will be way off the ground and usually swinging around as, as they release the ball. 
So they're releasing the ball when they're off balance on one foot. Now if we, and this is what half of my QB motion account is and my sport core count and some other stuff that I'm working on now, if we work on being more rotary first, so we generate rotational power in the drive turn phase of delivering the football, that gets the biggest, most powerful muscles. Now we're talking about the center of the body again. We're generating that drive turn with the glutes and the hips. We go rotary and then we finish linear. So the throwing arm comes out more linear on a cleaner linear pathway towards the target. What ends up happening, instead of the arm coming across the body this way, when we go linear to rotary, the arm comes through and down we finish with, you know, all the movements of the hand and wrist, right? We pronate, but the pathway of the arm is more linear. Now our accuracy and our, and our margin for error drops. Our spin rate on the ball actually goes up. The quarterback is able to have two feet in contact with the ground at release of the ball, which helps both accuracy. You know, I'm more balanced on two feet than I am on one. But it also creates an environment that, that's beneficial for deceleration. So any rotary movement, golf, baseball, throwing a football, we need to accelerate, but then we need to decelerate to transfer the velocity out the chain to the ball. And so that's a summation of velocity or summation of speed principle. So accelerate the hips and then decelerate the hips. And then rib cage, shoulders, elbow, hand, and the ball jumps. If we're over rotating and on one foot, because of our initial movement strategy of getting long, wide, and linear first, we're going to have a hard time decelerating. So we're taking what is potentially a, a major contributor to control and velocity, and we're just we're just spilling it on the ground because of our strategy for movement. So as a coach or as a young quarterback, take a look at you know a video or or your throwing strategy and say. You know, did I go really long first and then try to turn or did I turn first and then extend out of that, which is, you know, I've had, I've had lots of long in-depth conversations with guys who, you know, were significant NFL quarterbacks, et cetera. And, and at first there's always some resistance because that's not really the way it's always been done. But when we start talking about, again, the anatomy and the physiology and the mechanics of why this works better that's when all of a sudden they try it and they feel it and the eyes light up. And, and it doesn't matter if that's an 11 year old quarterback or a guy who's already retired. Um, so for me, that's been in, in the quarterback world. It went, a, you know, I had a guy reach out yesterday and he's a new CFL quarterback, very high level D one quarterback in the U S never, never communicated with him before. He's been coached by a number of the coaches, even guys that I've mentored and shared stuff with um and he sent me half a dozen videos and i said you know like i i need you to look at this and and this is the summary you are currently linear to rotary and when we simplify that and sort of flip it now we're going to have all of these advantages so does that make sense i mean it's kind yeah, of yeah no absolutely. it's a bit abstract in this world but it but it's also i've tried to oversimplify it no i, I think it's very like it's it's very clear and and i see it all the time with my guys in that, you know, like it for me, and I'm not, you know, very good golf. I'm not very good at golf, but if I have a long swing, like my swing gets worse and worse. Cause I'm like reaching, you know what yeah. I mean? Same thing yeah. I see with the, the high school guys when they, you know, big step or the arm is way far away from their body. Like there's the margin for error. Like you said, whether it's not achieving velocity you could have, or yeah. you know, your small miss becomes a big miss cause you're inefficient early in the movement. Um, you know, I think that's a really concrete idea coaches and, and players can take. So, you know, really appreciate your time. I know you got another thing coming up here, so I'll let you go. But, um, you know, I think I'll, I'll throw in the links and stuff to, to your yeah, please. pages. And, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I've learned a fair amount from already this summer and looking forward to, to seeing more. So I appreciate your time, Coach. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.